Hi and welcome to Spooky Isles. My name's David Saunderson and today we're continuing our series on Jack the Ripper, which we're calling Jack the Ripper Bits and Pieces with uh, Trevor Bond. How are you, Trevor? Yeah, good. Thanks, you. Very good. Thank you. Now, today we're going to talk about the McNaughton Memoranda. Now, what was the McNaughton Memoranda, uh, Trevor, and why is it important? So, the McNaughton Memoranda, written by Sir Melville McNaughton uh, in 1894, February 1894 to be exact. Um, McNaughton was a chap who was not not only not involved in the case uh, at the time of the, the autumn of terror, not even a policeman um, at the time, uh, which can be used to sort of dismiss his statement sometimes if you, if you favour a suspect who's not on his list. Um, but it's the first inkling we have of what the police were thinking about those murders, you know, six years later. Um, and most people, you know, it seems reasonable to to assume that he's working off, you know, official documents from the time and, and probably having spoken to some of the officers who were still around who had been involved at the time. So um, he was, he was what, assistant commissioner when he wrote this? Or did yeah, he become ass assistant commissioner? Ass ass he was assistant chief commissioner for crime at, uh, for the Met at the, at the time, yes. What, what was he doing at the time of the Jack the Ripper murders? Well, surely that you, that's quite a big high up position. Yeah, which he went straight into. Um, okay. He was man managing his family's tea plantations in India at the time of the murders. <laughs> well, he certainly wasn't a suspect then. So, <laughs> so what, how did it come about? What, what this document is a response to, uh, I believe, a newspaper report in the Sun that he obviously yes. got his nose out of joint. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah, the Sun did a big, a big sort of expose about a chap called Thomas Cutbush, who was arrested for how uh, well. <laughs> Uh, how can I put this delicately? Uh, well, what were termed jobbings, stabbing women in the bottom, uh, okay. in and around uh, Southwark and Borough and Bermondsey and places like that um, at the time in 1894. There's been a bit of research done into Cutbush recently, and uh, it does seem to have been quite a, a delusional and, and perhaps you know rel a bit more violent chap than than we've all often thought. Saying, well, clearly just stabbing someone in the bottom with a knife and sort of running away and giggling. You know, these weren't. These weren't wounds that were going to cause these women particular trouble for very long. It was, it was more like a sort of very bad, misogynistic, practical joke. Um, but yeah, the son decided to show that this man who had been in, in custody and in, uh, in various institutions previously had been allowed to escape, um, that, you know, had now was actually Jack the Ripper and obviously showed the police incompetence that they'd... Uh, he was still around six years later. So McNaughton writes up his not necessarily his thoughts on the case, more a, a sort of summary of the official position, really. Okay, so this was so this was an official position of the London Metropolitan Police, what he was writing, or was it just his general thoughts? Well, it's it's very difficult to say. I mean, this the, the memorandum isn't even addressed to anybody. Um, so it's discovered in the 1950s. Um, it's given to the author, or the daughter of, I think, actually, the uh, one of the early Ripper authors, Dan Farson. But uh, so it seems to have been an internal document that, you know, was perhaps there in case it was needed, you know, for the Home Secretary to give a statement in Parliament or whatever. So we don't quite know the intention of it, um, but the tone of it for me, it's quite, it's very official. It's, you know, he does use sort of personal pronouns a couple of times, but uh, it seems to me that he must have at least gone through contemporary documents, etc., and... Uh, I can't see that it, it doesn't read like this is what I think. It reads like here are the let me now tell you the facts. And this is why this story is ridiculous. OK, so therefore he may well have he possibly had access to documents that no longer exist today. Absolutely. I mean, as I said last time, there are references in the files that we do have to files that no longer exist, um, which is why, again, as I said last time, I think. A lot of suspects who the police were interested in at the time, I, I give that quite a lot of credence because they had more information than, than we uh, we ever will, even though they didn't have the internet. <laughs> so, so what does it tell us? What 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 is in this document that has uh, enlightened us about the Jack the Ripper murders? So he mentions three suspects by name. And it's important to point out that he doesn't necessarily say these were three likely Jack the Ripper suspects, or these were three top Jack the Ripper suspects. Um, he just says, here's an example of three people who were more likely than Cutbush. Um, and so you've got Michael Ostrog, you've got Aaron Kosminski, 
and you've got Montague John Druitt. Um, Ostrog, to come back to what we were talking about last time, is a fairly useless suspect, it turns out. Um, you know, McNaughton does get quite a few things wrong. Um, and one of them is that Ostrog was violent, which he doesn't seem to have been. Um, again, as we also said last time, he seems to have been in prison at the time. Um, so Ostrog has kind of been... When people talk about the memoranda, they very rarely talk about Ostrog these days. It's the other two. Um, Druitt is a really fascinating chap. Um, he commits suicide sometime in December 1888, which fits into, um, obviously, that little enigma of why the murders stop. Um, personally, my thinking on him is that his family sort of accidentally um, implicated him in, in uh, or put suspicion on him by trying to cover up other things that were felt to be uh, socially responsible and actually legal uh, at the time. And then you've got Aaron Kosminski. It's the first, that's probably the most famous thing about the memorandum. It's the first time you get that name Kosminski, which, which then gets cross-referenced in a couple of other um, police or police adjacent documents over the years. And that's what's given the, the memoranda, it's it's credence, really, because people see it as being externally validated by the fact that people like Robert Anderson and Donald Swanson, who were on the ground at the time in 1888, also refer to the suspect he does. Okay. You're saying you don't, you don't know that other than he's re he's, respond, well, he's he's written it at the time of the, the Sun newspaper report that suggested this bloke who was going around stabbing women up the, or stabbing women in the bottom, uh, yeah. was, was a Jack the Ripper person and he's what written a sort of almost like a policy document or something a briefing note that could use it never saw the light of day at the no, time it, it, no. it only turned up in the 1950s as a historical document yeah that's right to me it sounds as if um i would imagine that it was there in case there were this the sun's article had got a bit more traction than it actually did um and you know if there was a question in parliament for example you know, and the Home Secretary was asked, what does, you know, what are you going to do about these reports that the police let Jack the Ripper free for six years? And he could say, I have taken advice from the very senior police sources. And he has told me that, you know, whether he would have gone as far as, as naming people in the House of Commons, I mean, I mean, he would have had the privilege to do so. But uh... so, so you've got three candidates, well, three candidates, you've got three suspects there. Uh, you're saying one of them's ridiculous, so we discount them. You've got Druitt and you've got Kazminsky. How do you rate those two uh, two suspects? Because that's the highest on their list, and you you say, look, I have, you have to give the police credit because they know more about it than you do. All, yeah, they they had stuff that you didn't know about. Where 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 was Druitt and uh, Kazminsky at the time of nineteen and eight in ninety four? At the time of eighteen ninety four, um, Kosminski is already locked up in an asylum. Um, Druitt is obviously dead. Um, fished out the Thames in uh, in Chiswick on the on New Year's Eve, eighteen eighty eight. Um, at the time of the murders, Kosminski is right in the centre of the area, um, and uh, probably probably staying at his brother's house in uh, in Greenfield Street, which is pretty much right by the Burner Street uh, murder site, which is almost something that mitigates against him for me. Some people like that. I almost think that's that's too dangerous. Why would, why would you do it literally on your doorstep? Um, but he's certainly right in the area. Um, Druitt is not. Druitt is living some distance away and uh, working out of chambers in Temple. And there's been lots of work done over the years by people comparing uh, train schedules, because particularly after I think it's the Annie Chapman murder, um, which is obviously a bit further on in the day than the others. It's like 5.30 a.m. roughly. Because um, the other thing with Druitt is really, he was a very good amateur cricketer. Uh, once played for the MCC, in fact, in the uh, MCC versus Harrow game. Um, and he has a, he opens the batting in a match very shortly after uh, the Annie Chapman murder. So could he have got there? Um, he doesn't have the local links that Kosminski does. Um, so how do you rate those two then? I mean, they're fam they're very famous candidates, and all candidate. I keep calling them candidates, <laughs> suspects. But is that, like because, is, that, is that because is that because they're in this memoranda? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. And then, as I say, Kosminski also turns up in a couple of other documents. Um, Kosminski, as much as I am interested in having a suspect, I, I'd certainly probably put him at the top of my list. If you if you put the thumb screws on, um, the interesting thing with Kosminski is you know, he recently was obviously the suspect for the Russell Edwards book, Naming Jack the Ripper. 
um, with the whole fuss with the DNA with the shawl. Um, no problem with saying that I consider that to be massively flawed. Um, but it's something I used to have to point out on the tours a little bit that, you know, Kosminski did not arrive fully formed with that book. You've got to bear in mind there's still a very good, the DNA is nonsense, um, but there's a very good case for Kosminski even without that. Um, and he's someone that people have kept coming back to over the years. Um, Drew it, as I say, I think. So what happens with Drew it is he's found dead in Chiswick. Um, there's then an inquest. His family is pretty evenly split between very successful lawyers, and very, which is what Drew it's actual occupation was, and very successful doctors. And they obviously had a little bit of sway in the late Victorian society, such as it was. Um, and they managed to get a very quick, almost private inquest done, um, where not many questions are asked. There are even lies told about, you know, his brother turns up and says he's the only living relative, which is is not true. Um, and Drew had committed suicide. There, there was mental illness in his family, um, and he'd left a note at his chambers in Temple saying uh, that he'd been fearing he was going to become like mother. His mother was locked up in, a, in an asylum at the time. And... He'd been sacked from a school, Valentine's School in Blackheath, shortly before the murder start, which some people see as an inciting incident. Um, there's also a lot of suggestion over the years that perhaps the reason he was seems to have been fairly hurriedly kicked out of the school um, and paid off was perhaps he was actually homosexual, which obviously at the time, as we say, was uh, had not just a stigma, but was you know a legal stigma against it at the time. Um, and it certainly looks suspicious when you look at that inquest, the way the family are behaving. Um, my personal feeling is that by trying to cover up one, you know, quote unquote, crime and scandal, they've accidentally implicated him because someone, it seems, has gone back after the fact you know, it, between then and 1894 and gone, oh, hang on, here's a guy who dies shortly after and something fishy seems to be going on. Um, so I find him really interesting in terms of how did he ever become a suspect? Because there's not much else to suggest him. Um, but I wouldn't put him as particularly likely. Kosminski is certainly above him. So what, why did Druid get into that memorandum? Memorandum, memoranda. The memoranda. What, uh, I say my, my suspicion is that it was literally they trawled. Um, you know, someone had had the, the reasonable idea to think who was not available to commit, you know, who has committed suicide shortly after. Um, yeah. You know, Thomas Bond, who, no relation, um, who does a, uh, made some notes, did an additional uh, post-mortem on Mary Kelly, um, did some notes that were lost and then turned up many years later. Um, and he's often cited as having written in those notes one of the first profiles, really, because he goes a little bit further than just giving the details of what happened to Mary Kelly. And he says, this is the kind of person I think would have done this. Um, and he says in there that, you know, after his his awful glut in Miller's court, you know, this man's mind must have given way. And so that was obviously the way they were thinking. Um, and as I say, it's a fascinating question. How did he become a suspect that we may never quite answer? But I think the fact that there's that kind of thinking, here's someone who's committed suicide um, shortly after, was at least in London at the time. Um, and oh, look, there seems to be something fishy going on. Okay. So what, what, kind, of, what kind of bloke was uh, Melville McNaughton then? Uh, he was a careerist. Um, he came from that same kind of background as as Charles Warren, who was the head of the Met at the time of the murders. You know, an, another one who was an army man who is sort of parachuted into a very senior position. That was the way the late Victorian social structure worked. It was it wasn't the idea that you would you would want someone in that position. You wouldn't want someone in that position who had necessarily worked their way up through the ranks, like a couple of people start doing shortly afterwards. Um, you didn't say we want someone who really understands how the work works. You want someone who's a bit of a politician and you want someone who's seen as a, you know, a, a leader of men. Um, I mean, one interesting thing about him is he's what 35 at the time of the murders. So he's sort of late thirties by the time, late thirties, early forties by the time he's writing this, which, uh, it's quite interesting. Certainly if you put Melvin McNaughton into, I know people looked a bit older at the time, but uh, if you put his name into Google, you'll see a lot of very later images of him. And there's this, there is this idea of uh, of him as uh, perhaps a bit of a bit of an older man at the time, but he was, you know, he was a, an ambitious, relatively young man who was used to being in charge, who was on his way up, really. Yes, yeah, he was involved with uh, the prosecution or the of Dr. Crippen. Is that right? 
Yes, he was. Yeah, he was. Um, he also turns up because, um, say, he, he joins police very shortly after June 89. He becomes the assistant chief commissioner of crime. Um, so also we spoke recently, didn't we, about the torso murders. He turns up in those. Yep. Um, and he is, although I say he wasn't around for the Jack the Ripper murders, he is. His name does turn up in the Whitechapel, the wider Whitechapel murder file, at least, because as we spoke about with the torsos, he's um, he's obviously in that position by the time of the Pinching Street torso in, in Whitechapel, and uh, and yeah, Crippen he's involved with as well. He had he had qu- he had quite a career. He might have missed might have missed the big moment just before he joined, but he didn't have a, a bad career. So you you wouldn't necessarily say he was incompetent then. So what he wrote in this uh, memoranda, you, you could you could take seriously. I would have thought so. Yeah, I, I mean, there are errors in it. Um, which of those are his errors, and which are errors of the people who were giving him the information or originally transcribing the information? Um, but he doesn't seem to me like someone, and the memo doesn't mean like something, some something that would be written in you know a, a slapdash manner. I don't think it's just been knocked off in in five minutes in case it's necessary. Um, he strikes me as someone who would have made sure he had his facts right. Now, yes, okay, he says, um, he, he actually, he's, the other thing, his language in it is quite interesting. People like to concentrate on the things he got wrong, but he's quite clever at qualifying his language. Um, so, for example, with uh, Druitt, people will say, well, he didn't know what he was talking about because he says Druitt was a doctor. He actually says Druitt was said to be a doctor, mm-hmm. um, which I find quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so he's passing the blame on to whoever's given him that. Um, and he get, yeah. So no, I think he, I think he knew as much as, as anybody probably at the time. And he would have, would have been pretty, uh, thorough really. Uh, the other thing with drew it just to come back a bit that he, that he says, which is quite interesting is, and this is where it comes to what we were talking about earlier, how much of the memorandum is his opinion and how much is him synthesizing things from other sources. Um, there is one tantalizing little line about Druitt where he says, uh, from private information, I have little doubt that his family believed him to be the killer. Um, and he did have links to the area of Dorset where the Druitt family were very big. So it's not impossible that maybe there was a bit of genuine gossip there. But uh, I think that's a bit of an inference from the inquest myself. Are there any uh, any other? You you said there's reference in the in the memoranda to documents that don't, that no longer exist. Is there any particular tantalising bits that you you know that kind of mm-hmm. uh, we can see there's something there, but we just can't see what it is because the document's not there anymore? Uh, well, there's not in the memoranda as such. In in some of the other documents that still exist, um, although you could certainly suspect that. If he's been writing these from sources, that suggests there's probably a suspect file on Druitt, Ostrog and Kosminski somewhere that we don't have. Um, yeah. Because there's at least one um, one suspect file that we know is missing because there's the famous little child letter that people might have heard of, which is where the suspect Francis Tumblety first comes in, um, which is actually written in response to someone asking uh, little child about Druitt, but asking him about Druitt in a fairly sort of, coded manner just as dr d um and in reply he says i didn't hear about a dr d but i heard about a dr t and then he goes into a lot of details about this person that we later discovered must have been francis tumblety from the various biographical Mm. things and he says there is a suspect file on him we don't have that so it's in i suspect strongly there's suspect files on those other three um that we haven't got as well so so could we take the inference the fact if, if this is the best three that McNaughton could come up with, and one of them you just totally dismiss, and there's other things, the, the police just didn't know who did it. There wouldn't have even been a suspicion like, you know, I, I, I know who it is, but I can never prove it, you know, a bit so, sort of like your Michael Caine type of films, you know, where it's like they know who did it, but they never, you know, yeah. just, they just don't know. They just they didn't have a clue. I think he's cast a pretty wide net. Now, maybe he was doing that deliberately to illustrate it if he, illustrate a point if he has he's it's probably been a bit naive because it gives the impression that you've said um because we spoke a bit about last time didn't we when we were saying about what makes a good suspect about sort of archetypes for suspects um and it almost feels like he's picking one from each pot there you know he's got the the maybe maybe it was a posh english person who did it because you know or an upper class person with mental health issues maybe it was a foreign lower class person with mental health issues maybe it was a foreign career criminal um maybe it was someone who 
they stopped because they died. Maybe it was someone because they stopped because they went to prison. Maybe it was someone because they stopped because they got locked up in an asylum. He's he sort of picked one from each pot. Um, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, it's one of the many documents that we get we can still go through and and, and discuss from for many times. So I think what we're going to do next time is we'll talk about the legacy of Jack the Ripper because I'd be very interested to find out from you, like what happened after. Uh, immediately after the Jack the Ripper murders, mm. uh, obviously it's a big, uh, big uh, industry here in uh, London. Uh, we have Jack the Ripper tours. We haven't had money for for, uh, for a few months now. I imagine that we're all under lockdown. But I, I'd like to find out what the legacy was immediately after. So we maybe we talk about that next time. And uh, that sounds good. Uh, and I look forward to uh, talking about that. So thanks for that, Trevor. We'll talk to you later. Perfect. Bye. Bye.